Hello, I'm Derek Walker. I'm the pastor of the Oxford Bible Church. Today, we're doing a special study of the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, in Hebrew, it's sukkot, which means booths and temporary dwellings. Um, let's talk about the feasts. Three times a year, all the Jews were to go before the Lord to keep the feasts. And there's an interesting little point here that, yes, we worship God at home, but God also wants us to get out and go to church, uh, get together with God's people and gather together to worship. And that's what the Jews did, uh, especially for these three times a year. These feasts describe God's redemptive program and they are prophecies of Jesus. And he fulfilled all the feasts right on time. You know, God keeps his appointments on time. There are two Hebrew words for feasts. The first one is moedim, which means appointed times. Uh, and Secondly, mikra, or holy convocations, holy gatherings, or we could say dress rehearsals. These were prophetic dress rehearsals at appointed times that Messiah will fulfill right on time. And, and I want to just very quickly recap the first feasts. There are the first spring feasts in the first month, which actually were prophetic of Messiah's first coming. First of all, Passover. Actually, on the 10th day of the month, the, la the Passover lamb was set aside and was sacrificed on the 14th of Nisan. And this is a picture of Christ. In fact, he was set aside four days before in his triumphal entry. He was, as it were, presented to the leaders of Israel. They examined him, and he was set aside for death. And then he died as the Passover lambs were being killed in the temple. Jesus was being crucified as our Passover lamb. And uh, praise God. Uh, and then the next feast was the, on the 15th, which was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Actually, at the end of the 14th, all the, the Jews were removing all the leaven from their house. Leaven represents sin. And by, why? Because from the 15th onwards, uh, the, it was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and they could only eat unleavened bread. Um, and this, is, this removal of the leaven is a picture of Christ. What he did on the 15th when he was buried, he removed our sin. He took away the sins of the world. And then the next day, the 16th of Nisan, was the Feast of First Fruits. On the Sunday, always on the Sunday, the third day, the first fruits of the barley harvest were lifted up to God, uh, to be accepted by God. And on that very same moment, as they were doing that, Jesus, our first fruits, the first fruits of the harvest uh, that we are going to be part of, the harvest, but Jesus was the first fruits, was raised and accepted by God on our behalf. And the, the harvest, first fruits being offered up and accepted, was the guarantee of the rest of the harvest. And so that guarantees our resurrection. Jesus, the first fruits of the harvest to come. So Jesus, you see, fulfilled all the feasts of the first month. And then 50 days later was the feast of Pentecost. In those 50 days, the, 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 the harvest of the grain, the barley and the wheat was gathered in. And once it was all gathered in, again, it was offered up to God at the feast of Pentecost. And uh, this represents the church age, the harvest of the church age. And it begins and ends, I believe, at Pentecost. We live in the Feast of Pentecost. We're all Pentecostals, whether we realize it or not. And, and so the Feast of the first month is what Jesus did in his first coming. The Feast there of Pentecost is, again, uh, being lifted up to God is the church age, finishing with the rapture. And, um, and then after that comes the summer months, which is when the ver various fruits of the land, the olives, the vine, the grapes, and so on, the figs, are harvested. And then comes the final feast in the seventh month, which is tabernacles. And tabernacles uh, is the, when the feast of ingathering, when all the fruits are gathered in, and there's a great time of rejoicing at the end of the agricultural year. And the first fruits of all those fruits were offered up to God. And so the first coming is in prefigured by the feasts of the first month, the second coming of Christ by the feasts of the second, seventh month, and with the church age in between. The Feast of Tabernacles is also called the Feast of Ingathering. Let's look at the first mention of the feast in Exodus 23. Three times you will keep a feast to me in the year, says the Lord. First, the feast, you shall keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Then, 
and the feast of harvest, the first fruits of your labors which you've sown in the field. That's Pentecost. And three, the feast of ingathering at the end of the year when you have gathered in the fruit of your labors from the field. And at the second coming of the Lord, uh, all the fruit of the earth, the remaining fruit of the earth from all generations will, will, will be uh, brought into the kingdom of God. Uh, praise God. Well, the ingathering, the final harvest feast when all had been gathered in. And so there was great rejoicing and thanking of God for the completed harvest because it was at the end of that agricultural year in the holiday time before they started the new year with the sowing and so on. They were also praying for the outpouring of rain for the next year so they would have a good harvest for the next year. The rain would start in October to soften the ground for the sowing. And uh, it says that it's at the end of the year. That signifies that tabernacles speaks of the fulfillment of God's purposes. What started at Passover comes to fulfillment at Tabernacles. It's a great time of rejoicing because it speaks of God's ultimate purpose uh, for history being fulfilled. What is it all about? Where is history going? What's God's plan for his people? This is what Tabernacles is speaking about. It's speaking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's speaking about the ingathering of the harvest of souls into God's kingdom at the end of the age. Um, it's a time of great rejoicing. Exodus 34 says, You shall observe the Feast of Weeks, of the first fruits of the wheat harvest, that's Pentecost, and the Feast of the Engathering at the year's end. Well, it was a feast of great joy and thanksgiving for the harvest. Um, Israel was told to rejoice before God for seven days or eight days, giving thanks for his provision and, it, of, and his presence in the year. And so in Leviticus, it says, you will rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. It was total joy at Tabernacles. Uh, but it always happened after the Day of Atonement, five days before, because that was the day when atonement was made through a sacrifice for the sins of Israel. And only through atonement could they be under the mercy and the grace of God so that God could be with them at the Feast of Tabernacles. It's a picture, you see, that Israel will eventually fulfill the Feast of Atonement. They will repent for their sin. They will accept Christ and his atonement for them. And based on the atonement, they, are able, they will be able to enter into the Feast of Tabernacles, which represents God's presence and God's spirit with them. Well... It says in the Jewish literature that he who's not been to the Feast of Tabernacles and especially seen the water pouring ceremony, which is the Simkat Bet HaShoba, uh, which we'll talk about next time, uh, has not seen joy in this life. Such is the rejoicing. It was, also, it was called the, the Feast, you know, if they were the Feast. Uh, because that was the grandest of the feast, the most festive, the most sacrifices, the climactic feast. It was also the time of weddings, because this was when all the harvests were in, a few weeks of holiday there. It was later called the season of our rejoicing. And so you actually keep the feast by rejoicing. See the emphasis on rejoicing in Deuteronomy 16. You shall Observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days when you've gathered from your threshing floor and your wine press, and you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and daughter, your male servant and your female servant, and the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, the widow who are in your gates. Notice everyone is commanded to rejoice. Whether you're poor or down and out, you, whatever troubles you have, you put that aside and you rejoice. Seven days you keep a sacred feast to the Lord your God in the place where the Lord chooses because the Lord your God will bless you in your produce. And in all the work of your hands that you will surely rejoice. Literally it is, you will have nothing but joy. And at that time, four species were waved before the Lord. It says, you shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of beautiful trees. Nowadays, a citron is used that's a bit like a lemon. It's called an etrog. And that was, was used and waved before the Lord as thanksgiving for the fruit harvest. And they would also carry three branches of different trees bound together in what's called a lulav. There were, th first of all, branches of palm trees, uh, which is the big one in the middle. And then there were the boughs of leafy trees, which was now the myrtle branches, and then the willows of the brook. 
and it says you shall rejoice with these holding these in your hand and waving them you will be rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days everyone goes round holding these branches and waves them in all six directions north south east west up and down and they were praying throughout the feast Hosanna save us now Lord and send prosperity and so these are used as symbols of prayer and thanksgiving. The willow, you see, only grows by water. So when it's lifted up, it's a prayer for rain and for the outpouring of the Spirit. The palm tree, as on all the coins of the time, represents nationalism, prayer for deliverance from enemies, prayer for, for self-rule, as it were. And that's why they waved palm trees at the triumphal entry of Jesus. They were saying, Hosanna, save us from the Romans. Ultimately, this is a prayer for the Messiah, that he would come and set them free from oppression and establish them as a free nation. And then the myrtle, which represents shalom, peace, prosperity. And again, it's a prayer for the Messiah to come and bring peace and joy and his spirit on the earth. And that's, they prayed this prayer, Lord, save us send prosperity and then they knew that this would only be fulfilled through the Messiah because the next verse says blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and so at this feast they were also looking beyond to the Messiah and praying for the Messiah to fulfill the feast at his return and that's why he will return at Tabernacles because he's taught them to pray for his return at Tabernacles and he will return and he will set them free from their enemies and he will pour his spirit out upon the earth and he will gather in the harvest of the earth at his return at Tabernacles. So both at his first coming and at his second coming uh, took place at Tabernacles. He was born at Tabernacles and he will return again at Tabernacles. And so also at Tabernacles, they would build a sukkah, a booth. That's called the Feast of Booths, uh, a temporary dwelling place where, that they would live in during this time, during the feast. And in Leviticus, it says this, on the 15th day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. And the first day, a holy convocation. You'll do no customary work on it. For seven days, you will offer an offering to, made by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day, you will have a holy convocation. It's a sacred assembly and so forth. So the feast is for seven days, but there's also a special eighth day mentioned as well. Not part of tabernacles, but connected to it, following it, a day of rest and rejoicing. The last special feast day in the year. And this has to be a picture of eternity when all the feasts are, have been completely fulfilled through Christ. It goes on to say in verse 39, on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you've gathered in the fruit of the land, you will keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. On the first day, a Sabbath rest. On the eighth day, a Sabbath rest. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It will be a statute forever in your generations. You will celebrate it in the seventh month. And then it says, you will dwell in booths, temporary huts, for seven days. All who are Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths. When I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I'm the Lord your God. So they made booths to live and eat in for seven days. The roofs could not be perfect. There had to be holes in them to see the stars and to feel the rain. They were to remember the wandering in the wilderness when they came out of Egypt, when they didn't have houses, but when they lived in tents. And especially they were to remember that God dwelt in their midst, in his tent, the tabernacle. They saw his glory, the pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day. And the meaning of tabernacles, you see, is God dwelling with his people in the midst of his people. Because that's, God's, that's why it's the last feast. God's ultimate purpose is to dwell, to tabernacle with his people, in his people. That's why Jesus died for us at Passover, so that we can enter into tabernacles, that God with us and in us. He didn't just save us from, to save us from hell, but that we would be united with him together in loving communion, that we would know his glory and his spirit in us. God united with his people, in the midst of his people. That's what redemption's all about. And that's why it's a feast of great rejoicing. This is what it's all about in tabernacles, the presence and the glory of God with us and in us. And this is only possible through sacrifice. For example, at tabernacles, there were 70 oxen sacrificed, 13 the first day, 12 the next day, and so on. And Numbers 29, speaking of Christ's sacrifice for all nations, because the number of nations in Genesis 10 originally was reckoned to be 70. 
And so it was particularly a time of prayer for the nations to know the God of Israel, a prayer for the harvest of the nations. It was a feast for the nations, as we see in Zechariah 14. The vision of tabernacles is that all nations would come and worship the Lord. And it's interesting, there are two stages in the fulfillment of tabernacles. The first one is living in a tabernacle, that's a temporary dwelling. And that's what Jesus did in his first coming. He tabernacled among us just for a short time. And that's why Jesus was born at tabernacles. You know, it says he, the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. He fulfilled tabernacles. If the first coming was pictured by the tabernacle, that temporary dwelling, the second coming is pictured by Solomon's temple. You see, the tabernacle and the temple represent the two comings of Christ and the two phases of our physical existence as temples of the Holy Spirit. Right now, our body is a tempt, a temporary dwelling of the Holy Spirit. In a sense, tabernacles is fulfilled in us if we're born again. But what is coming is not just a tent, but an eternal building. Our resurrection body is an eternal building that will last forever and ever. And that is like that, that permanent temple. And so God is in our present tabernacle, but he'll also be in our eternal temple. And Christ fulfilled tabernacles at his first coming with his birth in, in his tabernacle but also in his second coming in glory, when he will be in his eternal resurrection body, uh, shining with the glory of God. And so at each coming of Christ, he brings his people into the next fulfillment of the feast. Praise God. The tabernacle with the indwelling spirit represents us now in Christ, in our temporal bodies. But the temple of Solomon represents in us in our resurrection bodies. And it's interesting, you see, that Solomon's temple was dedicated at tabernacles because it was a tabernacles event. We see the united praise and thanksgiving of his people, and we see the temple filled with his glory. It says in Chronicles that all the men of Israel assembled with the king, Solomon, at the feast, which was in the seventh month. It says, when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. It was tabernacles time. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, for he is good and his mercy endures forever. You see, we live in a temporary tabernacle. But if we have accepted Christ, tabernacles is filled in us because we have the spirit, the glory of God within us, just as Israel had the God dwelling in their midst. So we can rejoice in that fulfillment of tabernacles. But there's a greater fulfillment of tabernacles coming because one day we'll receive our permanent resurrected bodies and the glory of God that's in our spirit will be fully released in through our whole being. And we will enter into the ultimate fulfillment of tabernacles that Solomon's temple spoke of. Now, Jesus fulfilled tabernacles. He was born at tabernacles in 2 B.C., John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then the Word became flesh, that's his conception, and dwelt or tabernacled, literally pitched his tent among us and we beheld his glory. That's a tabernacles event. God with man and his glory revealed. God pitched his tent in our midst in the person of Jesus Christ. And as God pitched his tents in the midst of Israel and they saw his glory, so he pitched his tent among us in the body of Jesus. And we beheld his glory and his birth was a fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. He had to be born on a feast day. Feasts are used for all the major divine appointments. And this was as major as you can get. John the Baptist was conceived after his father Zacharias had completed his week of service in the temple. He was part of the eighth out of 24 priestly courses that took their turn to minister in the temple. It's the course of Abijah in Luke 1.5. And so we can actually calculate the time of year when that happened. We also know that Jesus was conceived six months later than John at Hanukkah, so if we then add the 280 days of a perfect pregnancy, we get to tabernacles for Jesus' birth. So from John's birth, uh, conception, we can go forward to his birth, and then uh, plus the extra six months for Jesus, 
uh, we can calculate and confirm that Jesus was indeed born at Tabernacles. In Luke 2, 8, it says, they were in the same country, shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Now again, the time of Jesus' birth could not be winter because there's no way the sheep would be outside on the fields. It would be too cold. It couldn't be after November, November or after, on that account. But notice the shepherds had actually set up camp on the fields. Now they do this even to this day at a certain time of year, which is around the time of tabernacles. Because normally the sheep would not be allowed to graze on the fields. They would tread it down and spoil and eat the crop. But September, October time, when all the harvests were in, and before it was time for the plowing and the sowing in late October, the shepherds were welcomed by the farmers to camp out on the fields. The sheep, you see, could be helpful to clear the field, eating up remaining stubble from last year's crop and fertilizing the field. And so it was around the time of tabernacles when the angels appeared to the shepherds. And so his birth is a clear fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. Another confirmation is that Jesus, we know, he lived 33 and a half years. 30 years to his baptism, he was baptized on his 30th birthday. And then he had a three and a half year ministry. So if you go exactly 33 and a half years from Tabernacles, you actually get to Passover in AD 33. And that's the very day that he would died on the cross. So it all fits together. Jesus was baptized at Tabernacles because it was on his 30th birthday. And again, his baptism is a clear Tabernacles event when the, he, his temple was dedicated to God for his mission and the Holy Spirit came on him. Just as the glory of God filled his temple at Tabernacles, just like Solomon's temple, you see. And, and we see that in Luke 3, 21. It says, Jesus also was baptized and while he prayed, the heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove on him. And the voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved son. In you I am well pleased. Now Jesus himself, it says, began his ministry at about 30 years of age. But actually, this, the, this is in italics. The translator has, tried to, has added a meaning here. What it actually says is, literally, Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. Isn't that interesting? In other words, he was just turning 30. It was on the edge. He was entering into his 30th birthday when he was baptized. And even the word about that some people say, oh, he could have been 35, he could have been 40. No, this word about sounds like an, a very vague, number, but vague word. But actually, when it's used with numbers, it denotes precision. For example, in Acts 13, 18, it says that Israel wandered in the wilderness for about 40 years. Well, actually, we know that they wandered in the wilderness exactly 40 years to the day. And the manna stopped exactly to the day of 40 years. So it's precision. It says there are about, in Acts 19, about 12 men who were baptized by Paul in Ephesus. But there were, of course, exactly 12 men. And so when it says about 30 years, it means he was exactly 30 years old. In other words, if he was born at Tabernacles, 2 BC, um, exactly 30 years later on his 30th birthday, it had to be Tabernacles again. And so we see how Jesus fulfills everything right on time. He fulfilled Passover on time by dying as our Passover lamb. He fulfilled unleavened bread in his burial by removing our sin from us uh, to the depths of the earth. And then he fulfilled first fruits by rising from the dead, just as the first fruits was offered to the Lord. And then on the day of Pentecost, of course, the Holy Spirit was poured out. He poured out the Holy Spirit upon us. And uh, there is more things to happen on the day of Pentecost, I believe. And the feasts of the future will also be fulfilled on the day of atonement in the future. Israel will repent and they will see who he, they will see him whom they pierced. They will see Christ through the eyes of faith that he, and they will mourn for him as for a firstborn son. They will realize that he's the son of God and they will accept him at the Day of Atonement, and then they will start to pray for him to return to save them. And at the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus will return in power and glory, 
and he will cover the earth with his glory. And he will gather in all the righteous fruit of the earth. And those who have died in, in times past, all the dead from all generations will be resurrected. The fruit of the earth will be gathered into the kingdom of God. And all the uh, stubble, all the chaff, the wicked will be removed from the earth and burnt in fire because it's the harvest is the end of the age. And at that time when Jesus returns just before, it says he will trample out um, the, gra the grapes. Uh, the armies of Armageddon will be trampled by him, just like grapes in, in the grape vat. And he will gather in that final harvest. It will be a fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles as the harvest of the earth is gathered in, praise God. And then he will fill the earth with his glory. And so Jesus will fulfills all the feasts. He's already fulfilled stage one of Tabernacles because he was born at Tabernacles. And if we accept him, Tabernacles is fulfilled in us. But I want you to realize that you can rejoice you can rejoice that the Feast of Tabernacles is fulfilled in you because the Spirit of God lives in you. Praise God. You can rejoice that you are united to God forever. And you can rejoice in the future fulfillment of tabernacles that one day you won't just have a tent, you will have a temple, a permanent building of God that will be eternally flooded with the glory of God. Hallelujah. And one day soon, Jesus will return at the Feast of Tabernacles and establish his glorious kingdom upon the earth. Praise God for the Feast of Tabernacles. So Tabernacles is a feast that celebrates the fulfillment of God's purposes for man. God living with man, in man, united to man. Man being a temple of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. And it's a celebration of God with us. So it was a feast of great rejoicing. And it's based on grace. It's grace through sacrifice. You see, because it came straight after the Day of Atonement. On the 10th day of the seventh month was the Day of Atonement, the day when the sacrifice was made. And that released the grace of God for the people of Israel and their forgiveness and the grace of God. And so they could then enter into the Feast of Tabernacles five days later, rejoicing in the, in the glory of God, the presence of God with them, and the hope of even greater glory in the future. And we're going to look today at how they celebrated tabernacles in the time of Jesus. Because interestingly, there were two ceremonies given by the Holy Spirit that were practiced at the time of Jesus. They're not in the law of Moses, but they were introduced by the prophets. And I'm pretty sure it was by Isaiah because of his prophecies fit with them. And Jesus endorsed these ceremonies in the New Testament. And he actually based his teaching around it. And he claimed that he fulfilled them. And the first one is called the water pouring ceremony. Now, in tabernacles, they, are, they didn't sleep much. They are rejoicing late into the night, all week long, especially on the last day, the last great day of the feast. And uh, the main focus in tabernacles of the rejoicing um, uh, was this water pouring ceremony. And it was a picture of the Messiah uh, receiving the Holy Spirit and pouring out the Holy Spirit on his people. And, uh, and so it was based on uh, Isaiah's vision of the Messiah bringing the Holy Spirit. It's all a picture of Christ, as I want to share with you. And uh, what would happen is that at, at the break of dawn, each uh, morning, the high priest would take a golden jug. And this golden jug represents Christ. You know, gold is the metal that represents the divine nature. And this golden jug would, would be taken, and you'll see on this model of Jerusalem, you'll see the temple at the top. And the high priest leads a joyful procession at dawn from the temple, and he goes with this golden jug down to the pool of Siloam at, at the bottom. Now, the waters of Siloam represent the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 8, 6 says, the people refuse the waters of Siloam that flow softly. It's a picture of the Holy Spirit. The waters of Siloam come from the Gihon Spring, which is the original spring of Jerusalem. And that's actually where Solomon was anointed at that spring. And those waters flow through Hezekiah's tunnel uh, into the pool of Siloam. And that's where this procession goes down with great joy rejoicing. And they draw the water 
and fill the golden pitcher from the pool of Siloam, just as Isaiah said, therefore with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And Hezekiah's tunnel was built by Hezekiah, of course, and he channeled the waters of the Gihon Spring into the city to the pool of Siloam, where the people would collect them in safety. And he, this is where the tunnel ends. And so this small pool used to be known as the pool of Siloam. But recently, the real pool has been discovered nearby, uh, which, and it was more impressive. The healing of the blind man took place at the pool of Siloam. It's a picture of the Holy Spirit opening our eyes. And there were steps that uh, would uh, lead down into the pool, and it was quite a large rectangular pool with steps leading down. And people would go there to, to ritually immerse themselves and before going up to the temple, and others would use it, use the water. It was the water supply for the city. You see there are circular holes for the water jars uh, that would be, were found right there. At the site, there are these lovely murals that give us an idea of what it would have looked like. It was one of the most important places in the time of Jesus. And they've discovered also a walkway that goes from the pool up to the temple. And so having drawn the water with great fanfare and shouts and trumpet blasts, the procession goes up to the temple and they are declaring Isaiah 12.3, with joy you shall draw water from the wells of salvation. You see, Isaiah saw what Messiah would do because it follows Isaiah 11, which talks about the, the Messiah. And so he, I believe Isaiah designed this joyful ceremony to act out prophetically what the Messiah would do. And we'll see, it was fulfilled perfectly by Jesus. And the Psalms that they would be singing all the time at Tabernacles, especially at the water boring ceremony, was the Hallel, which is Psalms 113 to 118. Especially 118 was the Tabernacle Psalm. I'm going to read some of it, and you'll see how fitting it is is for the Feast of Tabernacles. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents, the tabernacles of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. And then they would come to the water gate of the temple, and they would say, open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them, and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you, for you have answered me and have become my salvation. And then the stone which the builders rejected, that's the Messiah in his death, has become the chief's cornerstone. That's him, his resurrection. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And then the water would be taken into the woman's court. And then further, it would be taken to where the altar was, right in front of the temple. And then they would be singing, save now, or Hosanna, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Speaking of the Messiah, we have blessed you from the house of God. And so this is what God ordained for them to sing every tabernacles, to invite the Messiah to come at the Feast of Tabernacles, because that's what tabernacles represented. God with them. God coming to them, dwelling in their midst. And so they were looking and praying for the Messiah to come, to save them and to bring his peace and to pour out his spirit. And this would take place over seven days, just like Jericho, uh, because it signified them coming out of the wilderness into the fullness of God's blessing. And so they would march around the altar once each day with their lulavs, Remember those uh, branches that they would hold, and they would be praying Psalm 118, and they would be rejoicing. And uh, also willows were put round the altar. Willows were connected with rain. And so they were praying for the rain of the Spirit. This water ceremony was first of all a prayer for rain, for the rain for the coming year, and thanking God for the rain of the past year. But also the Jewish rabbis understood this was a prophetic picture of the rain being of the Holy Spirit that would be poured out by the Messiah. Then on the final seventh day, everything was magnified seven times. And so the excitement was building up during the week. And uh, on the last day, they were rejoicing with greater joy and greater shouts of praise and praying the same prayers, praying for God to save them. Hosanna, save us, and for peace and for spiritual blessing and for the Holy Spirit poured out. And on the seventh day, they went round the altar seven times. And so the exciting is building up from, to the crescendo. And then each day, the priest 
ascended to to pour out the water. Now a tradition drew up that in this ceremony, you see, the, the priest ascends to the high, tall altar, and he is to pour out this water, the water of Shiloham, the water of the Holy Spirit. The tradition came up that uh, as the priest ascends to pour out the water, the crowd all cry out, raise your hand. In other words, we want, you to, we want to see you pour out this water. Because sometime before Christ, the Sadducees who ran the temple didn't like this ceremony because it wasn't in the law of Moses. So they, they didn't, a certain priest didn't do it properly, just kind of poured it away and didn't pour it out properly. And the, the crowds were so upset, they threw their citrons at them at them. If you remember, they all carried around the fruit as thanksgiving to God. They all had a, a citron in their hand and they pelted him with their citrons. And so from then on, the priest had to raise his hand to pour out the water. And it symbolized God's reign and his spirit. It was prayer for next year's reign and prosperity. It was prayer for the Messiah to come to pour out his spirit. So they were doing three things, I suppose. They were thanking God for the previous harvest and the previous rain. They were praying for God's continued presence and provision for the next year's rain and harvest. But they were also looking to when the feast would be fulfilled by the Messiah who would come and dwell among his people. And now we want to look at Jesus in the Feast of Tabernacles. We're going to see uh, what, what happened. It's in John chapter 7. And it says that the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. But when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were, in secret. Why? Because they were out to kill him. Interestingly, in verse 14, in about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. See, after three and a half days, he showed himself and began to teach. The seven days represent the two halves of his seven years of ministry. During the three and a half years of John the Baptist, he was in the background, and then he ministered publicly for three and a half years. And it's the same way in, in, this, in this feast. But it was at the end of the seven days that he ascended and poured out, it, it was at the end of the seven years rather, that Jesus ascended and poured out his spirit. So Jesus chose this last day, um, the last day of the feast, the climax of the feast, to announce in a dramatic way that he was the Messiah and he was the one that would fulfill the ceremony and pour out the spirit. That's what we see in verse 37. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out. We'll see what he cried out in a minute. But this last day, the seventh day, is called the Hoshana Rabbah, the great Hosanna. So all week they're praying Hosanna, but on this day they're praying it seven times more, the great Hosanna. And so after the seven circuits around the altar, the high priest ascends the altar. He lifts up his hand to pour out the water. And also they would be pouring out the a wine in a separate jug. And they were pouring from the gold cup, the gold flask that represents Christ, that water that he had received. In, and then it would be poured down into a silver vessel below. There was a silver vessel standing on the altar. And they would pour from the gold vessel into the silver vessel. Uh, and the silver represents redemption. The silver vessel represents the redeemed. So this is a picture of Christ who is the gold, the, the divine one, pouring out the spirit into the redeemed. And it's interesting that there was a hole in those silver cups so that the water went into the silver cups, but then it flowed out of those, out of the hole in that silver cup, and it went down to the ground level, to the earth. And this represents the outpouring of the Holy Spirit through the Messiah. See, Jesus is our representative high priest. He's the one that came down. And he's the one that received the water of the Holy Spirit in himself on our behalf in that gold cup. And then he ascended on high and he poured out the Holy Spirit to be received by us who are the redeemed, who are also exalted with him, in him. And then the water of life is to flow through us out to the people on the earth. 
And this is the moment where that Jesus chose to make his great announcement. See, excitement had been building for seven days. Even more as they completed the seven circuits of the altar. Great shouts as the high priest ascends on high. The climax of the feast. All is ready. The, ho the high priest holds the gold container. The, sh the crowd shout, raise your hand. And he raises the gold cup high. And silence descends on the whole crowd as they wait to see the outpouring. And as he is about to pour out the water, somebody cries out from the balconies above, crying with a loud voice that breaks the silence. And this is where we read, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. I'm the source of living water. They flow from me. Come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. What's he saying? I'm the Messiah. I will fulfill tabernacles. I've come to fulfill the water ceremony. I am the golden pitcher. I have the water of life, and I will pour it into any silver vessel who is open to me and will receive that water. And that water will then flow through you to others. And his words were ringing out the very moment the water was being poured from above at the water ceremony. And it perfectly fits the ceremony. You see, the water pours, the, the Messiah pours the water out into his people, and then the water flows through his people down to the earth. And then he says, but this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. He's saying this, would be, this was going to be fulfilled when Jesus poured out, ascends on high, pours out his Spirit, and his people would receive the Holy Spirit, and then the Spirit would flow through his people as rivers of living water. Praise God. Jesus, our high priest, came down to earth and humbled himself to become a man, paid the price to receive the Spirit for us. Then he ascended on high and poured out his Spirit on us so that it also overflows through us. Praise God. And the second ceremony was the illumination ceremony where four massive 70-foot lamps in the temple were put in the temple during tabernacles in the women's court. And each of these had four large torches and they lit up the whole of Jerusalem at night. They were so bright. Massive quantities of oil were used and young trainee priests were carried up the anointing oil on ladders. These torches represented the light, the presence, the Shekinah glory of God shining out of the temple. And, and it was, the temple was called the light of the world. Another representation, you see, of the meaning of tabernacles that would ultimately be fulfilled by the Messiah, the presence of God in his people. See, all temples point to the ultimate temple of God, which is Christ and us in Christ, redeemed man in Christ. He's the true temple. He's the true dwelling place of God. Out of him shines the glory of God. He's the light of the world. But also in him, we too are temples of the living God, temples of his glory. And we too are called the light of the world. And tabernacles is all about the light and the glory of God shining out of us. And in John 8, 12, this was John chapter 8 also took place at Tabernacles that evening. Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. You see, in the time when all those that lights of Tabernacles were shining, representing the glory of God shining out of his temple, he says, I am the true temple. I am the Shekinah glory of God. I'm the light of the world. Praise God. The, the Jewish vision was that the light, the Shekinah of God, would shine out from the temple and all nations would come to that light. And in the same way, he's saying, I'm that light. And we are that light if we're in him. He says, I'm the fulfillment of tabernacles. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of light. Notice he says, you won't just ha have uh, that light shining upon you. If you believe in him, he says, but you will have the light of life within you. You'll become part of that temple and the light will shine out from within you. You will have the light of life. That life within you will shine out of you. You'll be the temple with the glory in it. And he will fill our temple with light. And he's speaking about when our spirit is reborn and indwelt. And the Ephesians says, we are now light in the Lord. We were darkness, but now we're light in the Lord. On the inside of you, the light is shining. And so 
Tabernacles is talking about the light of Jesus shining out of us, the rivers of his spirit flowing out of us. That's why Jesus died for us, that he can make us the temple of the living God, his light shining. Praise God. And so stage one of Tabernacles is already fulfilled in us, related to the first coming. When he came in a temporary tabernacle, we too are like him in that temporary tabernacle with the God's spirit within us. But stage two is also coming. He's already entered into it. He's got the glorified body. And one day he will return in that glorified body in power and glory. And also we will receive bodies that can handle the full release of the glory of God. Permanent temples, praise God, and tabernacles will be completely fulfilled in us. The glory of God and the light of God will radiate out of us. Praise God. We are the ultimate temple of God. Jesus is saying, I'm the glory of God that shines out from the temple of God. See, Christ in us is the hope of glory. And so they would have great rejoicing all night. The normally serious students and priests and rabbis, they cut loose. They were well known for juggling torches and knives, some up to eight of them at a time. Just rejoicing that God was in their midst and rejoicing in the hope that the Messiah is going to bring this feast into full manifestation. And Jesus will return at tabernacles. He hasn't finished fulfilling tabernacles. He will return at the Feast of Tabernacles and fulfill it at his second coming, just as he fulfilled Passover at his first coming, just after the Day of Atonement, the final Day of Atonement, the national repentance of Israel, and accepting their Messiah, by faith they will receive him, and they will invite him. They will say, blessed is he who comes at the name, in the name of the Lord, and he will return to save them at the Battle of Armageddon, and he will personally dwell and reign from Jerusalem, and his glory will cover the earth, and he will fulfill the Feast of Tabernacles. And this will also be the time of the ingathering of the fruit of the earth, all believers into the kingdom of God, and the removal of Satan and all the wicked into fire. And that is another fulfillment of tabernacles that is coming. Notice Jesus said in Matthew 23, he said, you will not see me, Israel, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord which is Israel inviting the Messiah to come and save them. Now God ordained and led Israel to pray this every year at Tabernacles. So this means he's ordained to return them. And both times Jesus come, came to the earth at the Feast of Tabernacles in response to Israel's invitation. First time he was born at Tabernacles, second time his second coming. And he said he had only re will return when Israel say that. So that's a tabernacles prayer. So they, he taught them to pray this at tabernacles because he plans to return at tabernacles. And that is why tabernacles will be the main feast celebrated by, na by the nations in the millennium. It's also the king's birthday. And uh, in this age, you see, we focus on Passover. In communion, the nations we focus on Passover. We remember that that feast has been accomplished. And we look forward to the future when tabernacles will be fulfilled. But in the millennium, when Jesus has returned and his glory fills the earth, the feast that we'll be focused on will be the one that's just been fulfilled, which is tabernacles. And as the, we live in the fulfillment of Passover, they will live in the fulfillment of tabernacles. Let's see this in Zechariah 14, a wonderful prophecy. It will come after the return of Jesus is described. It will come to pass that everyone who's left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. The nations will keep it. And it will be that whatever family of the earth does not come up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, on them, there will be no rain. Um, so they were to worship and to pray for rain again. And only when they obeyed God in that way, where they would have the rain and the harvest for the next year. So this will be the feast in the kingdom age, because that's when tabernacles will be fulfilled on the earth. It's interesting, this is, explains why Peter at the Mount of Transfiguration wanted to build three sukkot, three tabernacles. It was getting close to tabernacles time when this happened. And Matthew 17, he, they were given a foretaste of this coming kingdom when tabernacles is fulfilled. They saw the glorified Christ. They saw the fulfillment of tabernacles. They saw him in his glory. And, uh, and so he knew this was a sign of 
the fulfillment of tabernacles. And so he thought, great, this means the kingdom's about to come. And Tabernacles is about to be fulfilled. So let's make some booths and celebrate. But he got his timing wrong. Wrong. Jesus will do that, but it wasn't his time to do that. Because first of all, he had to fulfill Passover. He had to die as the Passover lamb. But he will. And this was a prophetic foretaste, a preview of coming attractions that Jesus appeared in his glory, saying, although you're going to see me die as the Passover lamb, I will also fulfill Tabernacles and I will be revealed in my glory and my kingdom. And so, even the millennium is not the ultimate fulfillment of tabernacles. You see, if the thousand years starts at tabernacles, and if it lasts exactly a thousand years, then it will also end at tabernacles. Revelation 20 says, Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan's released from his prison. And he'll go out to deceive the nations in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city, and fire came down from, out of God from heaven and devoured them. So instead of coming up at tabernacles to honor the king, they came in rebellion, but they're quickly destroyed. And immediately comes the destruction of heaven and earth and the eternal state begins. It says, I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face earth and heaven fled away. That's the end of this universe and there was found no place for them. So in other words, the end of the universe happens right there and the eternal state opens at tabernacles. Why? Because tabernacles ultimately is a picture of eternity. Revelation 21 shows the eternal state as the ultimate fulfillment of tabernacles. All the fruit of the earth, the righteous of all generations are gathered into his kingdom. The wicked are removed and the bride, the temple, is fully resurrected and glorified, filled with the glory of God. See the tabernacles in this. John says, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. This is God's dream, his purpose, his ultimate purpose. God himself will be with them and be their God, and wipe away every tear from their eyes. No more death, sorrow, crying. No more pain, for the former things have passed away. It is done on the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give her the fountain of the water of life freely to those who thirst. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, that's Christ, are its temple. And if we're in Christ, we're part of the Lamb, and we together are the temple indwelt by God. God lives in us eternally. The city had no need of sun or moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb, which is the bride as well, is its light. In other words, the, this glory illuminating shines out of Jesus and his bride. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. You see, the outshining glory that they possess as glorified saints contribute to the total glory and light. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of the street and on either side of the river was a tree of life bearing 12 fruits, yielding a fruit every month. The leaves of the tree for the healing of the nations. No more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb are in it, and his servants shall serve him. They will see his face, face-to-face -face fellowship, and his name shall be on their foreheads. We'll be just like him. There will be no more night. They need no lamp or light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And he said, these words are faithful and true. This is the ultimate fulfillment, eternity, prefigured actually by the eighth day. After the 7,000 years comes the eight, endless eighth day of eternity. So if you've believed in Jesus as your Passover lamb, and you've received him in your heart and his spirit has come into your heart, you've already entered into the first stage of tabernacles. The spirit within you wants to flow out of you. The light of Jesus within you wants to shine out of you. But there's greater things to come because one day your body will be changed into a permanent temple of God and the glory of God that's in you will be on full display. Tabernacles will be fully fulfilled. What rejoicing in the glory of God we will have for all eternity, living in the eternal fulfillment of tabernacles. Praise God. We can rejoice now that already because he's in us and he's with us and we can also rejoice in the hope of the glory of God Christ in us the grounds of the hope of future glory tabernacles is the fulfillment of God's plan and purpose for us